Oh, well, hello. Welcome everybody to Let's Make Art. Um, if you're not really sure what's going on, we're kind of just doing a Q&A here tonight because our March's box were slightly delayed. They're shipping out now. So we moved the treetop tutorial to this coming Friday, 7.15 Central Standard Time. That's where we'll paint this. We are still releasing the Iris tutorial tomorrow. So we're still releasing our pre-recorded tutorials as scheduled because I know that some of you have supplies and I just feel like as long as we can keep as much on schedule as possible that would be great. Um, so that's what we're going to do for our iris. That's releasing tomorrow. Um, okay so I'm just going to answer a couple of questions that I saw in the Instagram. Michael will be keeping track of questions on the comments so if you have questions let him know. Um, but I'm just going to start off with a couple that I saw, which was um, somebody asked me um, how I got into watercolor. So I actually majored in art, drawing, and painting at Sacramento State. Um, I didn't really do watercolor during college. I focused more in oils, and I took one watercolor class about 10 years ago, and I hated it. And I hated it because I didn't understand the medium. I just kept on trying to use it like acrylic paint, and it wasn't working, and it was really frustrating me. Um, but then as I got older and I had kids and I was an art major with oil painting, I wanted to paint at home, but it's super difficult to paint at home in a small house with oil painting because you need to have lots of like paint thinner and like spirits and all of these things to like clean the oils. And there's just a lot of smells and toxic things. And we have little kids. And we have little kids. And so I started watercoloring instead because all you needed was water, the cleanup was really easy, and um, I liked illustration. So I kind of just taught myself watercolor and I just fell in love with it. I loved how easy it was. I loved that all I needed was a cup of water and I was ready to go. And um, so I just started doing that a lot and then I opened, this is kind of answering the next question which is what I did before LMA. Um, I was just a freelance illustrator. I have an Etsy shop. I unfortunately don't keep it, <laughs> I don't keep it up to date as much as I used to, but I do sell prints of my watercolor works. I, I illustrated a couple of books. I was doing wedding invitations. I was just kind of a freelance illustrator. And then um, Al Doan, who was my business partner, approached me about starting an art company and a little over a year later, here we are. So that's what I was doing. And, and the funny thing was is um, I, really didn't teach that much before I started Let's Make Art. I think I taught maybe three workshops that were about florals. And um, I just feel like that was, <laughs> that was kind of scary that I just started this whole business on me teaching and I never really taught before or was trained how to, but it defense, worked out. In your defense, people love those classes like at West Elm and stuff. Yeah, so I would do watercolor floral workshops at like West Elm, which is a wonderful company. If you're a local artist and you're interested in trying to like how you can break into a local artist program. West Elm has an amazing local artist program, super supportive, they love their local artists. So if you have one by you and you're interested in like selling stuff, go talk to them, because they're so great. Also, to credit your teaching, yeah, you taught this cold-hearted man how to love. <laughs> <laughs> I did, there you go. I showed you the way, honey. <laughs> you're funny. Okay, so, those kind of answered those couple of questions that I saw. Now, um, Sarah asked if Al is still involved with LMA. Uh, Al is still involved. He kind of has like stepped back a little bit and kind of oversees the big picture. So you don't see him as much doing the video and all of that stuff. But just as we grow, we have to like hire more people to do all the different jobs. Um, but he's still around. Brittany's curious about the paper. Do you paint on one side or the other side? Can you use both sides? Okay, so the paper that we use in our kits is Canson, um, the blue pad right here. So this is Canson, it's nine by 12, it's 140 pound and it's cold press. So there is a front and back side to the paper. The side you're gonna wanna use is slightly more textured. Um, I have painted on the back before accidentally and it's not the worst thing in the world. So don't stress if that's happening to you, but try and paint on the front if you can. And um, 
th that leads to another question. So somebody asked on Facebook and on Instagram, they were talking about blooms, which are those watercolor textures that you get while you're painting. And they said like, sometimes I really like that, but sometimes I don't, and I don't know how to avoid it. So I did a little um, painting here so you guys can kind of see what's going on. So blooms happen, um, and maybe I'll show here. So if you're not really sure what a bloom is, this is what a bloom is. This is where you're gonna get these like interesting textures. Here is a good example where you kind of get a hard edge in the middle of something. Um, so a couple things about that. One, the paper we use, Canson watercolor paper, um, this paper tends to bloom more than other paper. I choose that paper on purpose because I purposely love blooms like I love them so much they're one of my favorite things in the world because I love that texture and that accidental element um, but just so you know it does happen more with Canson paper than maybe like arches or um, Stonehenge or other types of paper so that what's... I just want to interject here yes that this paper is funny because you've always used it and loved it yeah and one Christmas I bought Sarah a multi hundred dollar <laughs> roll of the most beautiful hand-pressed watercolor paper it's in a roll still <laughs> and she just uses this cans and it breaks my heart but it's, i'm sorry i want you guys to know that this is actually what she uses. this is really this is really the paper i like and i know some artists don't like it and that is okay and if you don't like it that's okay too this is just what works for me and i learned through teaching workshops that people just want to know what i use so that i'm just giving you exactly what i use um, and that's true about the roll. He bought me this huge roll. It was probably as tall as I was, the roll itself. It was huge. But um, I never, I left it for my mom when we moved to Missouri. I was like, mom, here's an entire roll of watercolor paper. I special ordered it. It he was did. like $370. Michael. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just like my $6 pad of paper, okay? Um, so, okay, back to the paper. So blooms occur because when you're doing your second layer of paint, there's a lot more water on it than what's already on the paper. So for example, in this very top one, and can they see that very well? Oh, sorry. Let's do the overhead so you guys can see it. Okay. So this one right here, I did a blue layer while the pink was still red. So immediately I painted pink and then I put blue right in there and it, doesn't have any hard edges, right? It blended right in. And that's because the wash was wet when I put that second layer of paint in. So usually when your paper is wet and you put in more paint, it will blend out, okay? Now this one, I waited for um, it to dry for a second before I did the second layer of purple or of blue, I, I just did blue over this. And the reasons why we don't have blooms here is because my brush was not very damp. So I made sure that my brush wasn't super wet. I just picked up some blue and I painted over the pink. So that's how I made this one. I still don't have that bloom texture because when I did my second layer, my brush was not very wet. Now this one, I painted the pink, I let it dry for a second, and then I did the blue over here, but my brush was really, really wet. And you can see here that we have a really hard edge from what, that wetness. So if you're having a really hard time with blooms and you're just trying to do a second layer and you're like, I'm getting these hard lines and I don't know why, it's because when you're doing your second layer, you have a little bit too much water in your brush and the water just doesn't have anywhere to go. Because if your bottom layer is dry, and then you do a super wet layer on top, it's, it's just gonna stay there. So it's kind of a balance of just paying attention to how much water you have on your brush when you're doing that second layer, and that will help you avoid blooms, or you have to paint quick to where you put your first layer down and while it's still wet, you're gonna put in more paint and your brush is not more wet than what's on the paper. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. Okay, wonderful. Got more questions for you. Okay. Okay, so people are curious about because they know you love P.H. Martin's paint. Yes. So they are going to the store and buying the Hydrus line and okay. not loving it as much. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the difference? The differences between the Radiance and the Hydrus and maybe even the Let's Make Art paints. 
Yeah, in general. In general. Okay, great question. So um, Dr. P.H. Martin has multiple lines of paint. Now the one that I prefer is the radiant line. There's like 52 colors and they're all beautiful. Now they also have a hydrous line. Both of these are liquid watercolors. However, hydrous is pigment based, which means it's light fast. And, but radiant is dye based, which means it is not light fast. So some people prefer the hydrous just because it is light fast. And if you don't know what light fast means, that just means that it will fade over time in sunlight. Um, I have tried the hydrous line before and sometimes it works really great and I don't mind it. But um, I found that hydrous, the colors weren't as vibrant for me. Um, also, they were a little bit harder to blend out. Sometimes there was like a texture with the paint or kind of like a graininess to them that I didn't, I didn't find in the radiant line. And as a, an illustrator, as someone who mostly scanned my artwork in and then made prints or you know, did wedding imitations, that kind of stuff, um, I prefer to work with really vibrant colors that blend easy and are easier to use. And so that is why I use that. Now, the dandelion paint that we use in our um, projects and in our kits are very similar to the Radiant line. Um, they are dye based. They are not light fast, but they're very vibrant in color. And we started mixing our own paints because we sell a lot of paint. <laughs> we sell a lot of boxes and it was getting really hard to uh, to like make sure that we would have enough paint for all of our boxes and so uh, we we make our own. In California they mix them um, but they're really similar to the Dr. P.H. Martin's Radiant line and that's why I'll tell you the equivalents because they're similar in colors. Um, but we kind of just started making our own dandelion paint because we could control how much we can make and it, that way we just won't have that problem as we grow if, um, if paint companies could keep up with us. Right. So um, no. So those are the difference between the three. Now the next question would be, is there a way that you can combat the light fastness? And I researched this um, a little bit today. So there are a couple things that you can do. Um, and just so you know, a lot of the blogs that I was reading and articles that I was reading, usually with any painting that you have, if you want to preserve it, you don't want to put it in direct sunlight in general, whether the paints are light fast or not. Um, there are two things that you can do. There is some kind of UV glass that you can use as a frame that will block out 98% of UV light, which will help protect the paint. Um, the other thing that you can do is get a spray, which is, um, there were two brands that I saw. One started with a K and one was called Golden, but it's basically just a spray that you put over your watercolor that will help protect the light fastness. Now, I did read reviews of all of these things because I never needed, I haven't used them myself since I scanned most of my work. Um, but if you were to use the spray, what I would suggest doing is try spraying it on a practice sheet first because some of the reviews that I read on some of the sprays is sometimes it can get like chunked up. And if you spray it too close, it will cause like a puddle, which will then like ruin your painting. So you just wanna like spray far away and like let it even out and make sure, do that on a scratch paper before you do it on the original painting that you're trying to preserve to make sure it doesn't ruin it. That's what I would suggest. Okay. Okay. Okay, we have more questions. Okay. I don't know if you know these, but uh, how many subscribers are there? <laughs> how many so? We, I don't know, I feel funny saying the number. Okay. I don't know if I'm supposed to say the right. number. We're in the thousands. It's more than five and less than a million. <laughs> more than 5,000, less than 20,000. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe it's not weird if I say it. I got to like talk to other people to make sure. I don't want anybody to get mad at me for saying this. But you guys are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Barry says, when we paint with you on Tuesdays, it seems like your paint is different colors than ours in the kit. Do you use the paint that comes in the kits? Do I use the paint that comes in the kits for the tutorials? Absolutely. The pre-recorded and the lives, I'm using that same dandelion paint that is in your subscription. Now what could look different in color is your screen. Usually um, screens that you're using, whether your TV screen or your computer screen, the colors are slightly off. Um, 
from what you would see in person and also in the reference photos like printing colors and matching those exactly is really hard to do so that's why sometimes your reference photos are slightly different colored and why uh, like what I paint up here it's slightly different colored than what you have and it's just because we're all seeing it through screens and reprints but I do make it a point to use the dandelion paint that we put in the subscription boxes for when I teach tutorials People are curious about framing their artwork, and as someone who has watched Sarah for years do this, you do cut it. Yes, okay. Yeah, people are looking for frames to fit this paper. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. So, we use nine by 12 paper, and this is what I use. However, nine by 12 frames aren't like a thing. They don't really exist. So what I do myself is I actually trim the paper down. I usually um, very, I don't think I've ever kept it nine by 12. Ever. It's impossible. So you either can trim it down to an eight and a half by 11, and a lot of what we paint, because um, our outlines are on eight and a half by 11 paper, and since a lot of what we paint are floating items, as in they're not like grounded, they should fit in an eight by 10 um, frame. You can trim them down. Uh, another couple things that you can do that I have done, let's say I have an eight and a half by 11 print or painting and I really like it but I can't find a frame is I'll buy a bigger frame and then mat it. So like I'll buy like an 11 by 14 frame at Ikea and just put the watercolor there with matting around the edges and then that way I don't have to trim my paper down to where it's like cutting off the edge or anything but it still fits in that frame. There's also floating frames that you can get but yes I, I probably should have said that before I always cut my paper down. Also because scanners are only eight and a half by 11 um, anyway. It's really hard to find a larger scanner. So most of the time I have to cut my, the paper just so it will fit in my scanner that I use at home. This perfectly brings me to my next question for okay. Barry. I guess I can answer this one. Okay. Barry is curious again about uh, scanners and printers. Mm. And so like, I feel like I'm the handyman around Sarah's Etsy shop. That's true. <laughs> so Sarah uses the cheapest Canon scanner possible. Actually, not the cheapest. It's just like a flatbed scanner from Canon. Or is it Epson? It's an Epson oh, scanner. Epson. Sorry. So, no, I can, answer, I can answer this too. So the first scanner I was using when I first started making prints of my work, it was just a scanner that was attached to my printer. It wasn't anything fancy. It was just one of those. But you want to make sure that you're scanning at a high DPI. And DPI just means dots per inch. And 300 is like to scale. So if you do have an eight and a half by 11, you scan it at 300 DPI, you cannot make it any bigger than eight and a half by 11. That's the biggest it can go without it getting fuzzy. So I usually scan my paintings in at 600 DPI or 1200 DPI, and that gives me the freedom to make it larger if I wanted to. So make sure you're scanning it good um, in DPI. Now, I have an Epson scanner now, and I can post the exact model tomorrow. Um, and the printer I use is an Epson 1430. I think they actually stopped making that printer. They keep making the artisan line that that yeah. printer is from. I don't know if the new ones are great, but... I haven't tried the new ones, but I have an uh, Epson Artisan 1430. I love it. It's excellent. It's a workhorse. Yeah, it's a workhorse. It's really gotten me through these last few years. Um, but the biggest thing I want to say when you're editing your, your artwork is you need to have a photo editing program. I use Photoshop because whenever you scan an image or even take pictures of the image, the color balance is going to be wrong. And every time I scan an image in, it desaturates the painting. So I just go into Photoshop and then I adjust the, that saturation level and those color levels to make it like the original. And I clean it up because sometimes scans pick up watercolor texture and then or the paper, like the paper texture. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, you're talking, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's okay. No, I know what you're talking about. I'm watching you. <laughs> That's what you didn't call me. Um, so I just edit that out and then I make prints of my work. And I can totally do a tutorial of what I use and how I use it. I would, of course, just like to say that um, there's not just one way to do it. There's multiple ways to edit your work. And if you found one that works for you, then, you know, go ahead and use it. I like to print my own prints. I haven't used a printing service for any of my prints because I really wanted to make sure that the color was correct. And when I sent them off, I was nervous that the proofs I would get back, like the coloring would be wrong and then we would have to do it all over again. So I just would rather have that power of editing the colors that are true to the original. 
we landed on the Epson because we needed something that did large format printing, and that was yes. like one of the better reviewed ones. Also, the paper that we ended up printing on is the Epson Premium Presentation. Yeah. Unit. Yes. So there's a bunch of different types of printing paper. I always like to go with matte because I don't want it to be shiny or glossy. Um, and there's two papers that I would recommend, either the ultra premium presentation paper or just the premium presentation paper. Both of those are great. And they do have like a front and the back side. So make sure you're printing on the correct side. And um, those, those papers I would recommend. They're great quality and they can match colors really well. Tamara from Facebook, the ones in the box now are from a company, if you were a subscriber in the early days, those were out of Sarah's printer. Yeah. And we would watch TV shows and yep. put them in the back for you. <laughs> so in the beginning days of Let's Make Art, when we first started the subscription box, I was the one that was putting them all together. I think our very first month we had 35 subscribers and we were thrilled. And I painted, I mean, I, I printed and cut every single one of those papers that went into every single one of those boxes. And we probably did that, I think, the first two months. But then I, I think I went to Al and I was just like, Al, I can't print these anymore on my own. Like it's taking so much time. So in the very beginning, if you were with us from day one, those were from my printer. And then now we use our, our fulfillment center has a printing unit attached to it. So they print those for us, which is so great. Sarah. Yes. You're doing awesome. And you look lovely tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. We've got lots of stuff going on. People okay. are talking about... Corel Draw, other programs. Um, someone, Nancy Mays, asked if you would suggest mixing tube paints and liquid for colors. What? She says, would you suggest mixing tube paints and liquid for colors? I don't have all of either, so I've been mixing. Oh, you can absolutely mix the colors that you need. And people have even asked me if you can mix these liquid watercolors with tube ones. Absolutely, you can. Mm -hmm. You can mix these with gouache. You can mix these with other watercolors. Um, don't be afraid to do that. The only thing I just want you to be aware of is if you are going to give an original away where it will be in direct sunlight for large periods of time and half of your painting is done with light fast paints and the other half is not, I don't know how that would fade. I'm, I'm not sure. But just be aware of that. It would fade beautifully. It would fade gradually, artfully. artfully. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great. We got a throwback from a while back. Someone asked, is there a way to combat the, what did you call it, puddling? Uh, the blooms. I was thinking with a paper towel before it dries. Yeah, so let me show you guys how to do that, actually. So... Um, blooms, I used to call them explosions, but blooms work too. That's when you get these really hard edges right here in your paintings. Um, Canson, again, this is really easy to happen on the type of paper we use in the kits. Um, so if that's super frustrating to you, maybe look at using a different type of paper, but I like blooms, so I kind of just don't let that bother me. Um, but if you're painting here and it's nice and wet, and you're doing some pink, and then right away, you put some color right on top of that, that's gonna blend out, that's gonna even out, and you shouldn't really get those blooms, okay? But if I were to put pink down, and I'm gonna like lift some of this up to kind of help it dry faster, So the, the thing you want to be aware of with blooms is if when you're doing this next layer, when you're putting this next color in and you have a lot of water on your brush, more water than what is on your paper, that is what is going to cause blooms. So if I were to go in with a super wet brush right here and put these in, then it's going to start creating blooms and hard edges. And that is because the water here wants some place to go. But if it's dry around it and there's no other place to go, it's going to stop right there and create a hard line. Um, sometimes you can use that to your advantage. That's what I do where like if I want textures and I'm like, I'm just going to drop in some water. I'm going to let that pigment move to the edge and it's going to be super cool. You can do that and you can use that to create interesting textures. Now, if that is happening to you and you don't like it, one thing that you can do is you can try and blend out the lines. Now, watercolor, the longer it dries, the harder it is to blend out. So if you can't blend it out all the way, don't be upset. 
But what I'll do is if this is too hard of a line while I'm painting, or this is, I will take a damp brush. Now you don't want it super wet because if it's super wet, it's gonna cause another bloom on your painting. So if it's super wet, just, just try and dry it off a little bit. Just take a damp brush and work that edge back and forth. And then you're gonna kinda wanna go work across the entire thing, because if you only do it right there in the middle, then you might create a bloom right there in that middle because it's only wet right there. Let me see if I can do it on this really hard one. And sometimes blending, it will blend out for me, sometimes it won't. I don't, I haven't figured out exactly why, but if that happens, what I'll do is I'll just do another wash to try and like even out the color a little bit. Kind of like an in-between color. And try and mask that hard line with another wash of color over it. While you're painting, uh, yeah. Susan is curious if you and Nicole are planning paintings, like joint painting projects, or is it a secret? Or <laughs> so some of you have seen that we have released a beginner series for lettering, or we're starting to release that and we have our own Facebook group for lettering now. We have more announcements to come. I'm not gonna spoil any surprises, um, but just keep an eye out. Just be patient, keep an eye out. It's, it's great, and I hope you guys enjoy Nicole as much as I do. She's I, a peach. She's so great, and I think she has a really similar teaching style where we really just want you to create and like not be afraid of this and to try. So she has some fun stuff. We have some fun stuff planned. Just stay tuned. We'll tell you about it. We got uh, Gina says she's signing up. She's a self-taught illustrator. Oh. She loves learning new tips and supporting other women. Women power. Gina, thank you. Yes. Yeah, the women power. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Good job being a self-taught. That's so great. And thanks for painting with us. Jan, you can't do that with the Hydra's line because it is pigment based and it's just how it adheres to the paper differently. It's, it's not something that will work out well. Yeah, depending on the brand of paint that you use, I have noticed that with like the liquid watercolors, specifically the radiant line or ones that are dye based, they tend to actually like blend out way easier. Like for me, their workability is so much easier than other paints. That's also why I prefer them. So um, just keep that in mind when you're painting. That does not mean, and I just want to say that like, just because I use these paints or this is what I like, that they are the best. That It's just what I like. And so I don't want you to feel intimidated by trying other things or thinking that because you like a different kind of thing um, that it's wrong. It's not wrong. Maybe you don't like that it blends out so easy and you want something else that won't, you know, kind of bleed into things as quickly. That's totally great. Feel free to explore other watercolor materials. Babe, do you want to go back on the front camera? Oh. Sorry. No, it's okay. They're on the little screen. Um, let's see, we got other questions. Oh wait, that oh. reminded me of a question that somebody commented on, which was, um, they asked like why these supplies. So I kind of talked about why I like the Radiant line. And what I used before that was just normal, I think I used Cotman uh, watercolors, which is those two paints. And I used some Daniel Smith before. And then an illustrator that I really admired and I loved her work, she posted the materials that she used. And one of them, uh, some of them was the Dr. P.H. Martin Radiant line. So I ordered a set and I just fell in love. Like I, I don't even know if you remember, but I could not stop painting forever. Like was crazy. everything I painted, I was just like, Michael, look, like I painted carrots and I was just like, look how bright this <laughs> carrot is. I was Seriously. like painting everything because I'm like, these colors are so amazing. And it really ignited my love for watercolor. I don't, I don't know if I would be painting as much if I didn't really find these supplies. So um, don't, don't like stop if you try something and it doesn't work. It could just be you're not using what, that, that thing that gets you going. So that's why I like it and that's why we put it in these boxes. It's okay if you don't like it, and if you don't, that's fine. Find something. Find something that does make you want to paint everything you see. It's the greatest. All right, got a few. Okay. Um, Nicole is not a Missourian. She's mm -mm. from California. We were from California also. We moved here. Yes. 
and we're trying to get her to move here. Probably not <laughs> um, Someone said, we know you use a two and a six a mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. For larger areas, do you get by with a six or do you whip out like a, a 30? I don't know. Do you have a okay. bigger brush that you go to? Yeah. So for the projects, I stay within a two and a six because basically it's just easier. And most of the time I do usually just use like two brushes for projects. Um, so that's why we stay within the two and the six. However, if I'm doing landscapes or if I'm doing larger paintings, I absolutely will use larger brushes. So um, another good brush, if you're gonna get uh, uh, like bigger brushes, I would do like maybe around 12 is a good one. And also like a wash, which I have right here, I'll show you guys. So here's a wash. It's kind of just more square right here. This is great for when you're doing like, like for me, I just keep on thinking landscapes. When you're trying to do like a wash, like a sky or something really quick and you need to fill a whole space quickly because you want the colors to blend together smoothly, then a larger brush is the way to go. And maybe a flat brush is the way to go for that. But yeah, I would suggest getting larger brushes also. Okay. Um Sharon, I'm sorry, I forgot your question I meant to ask her. Sharon wants to know, she lives in the UK. Okay. Is that something that's doable with the boxes? Shipping to the UK? Yes. We do ship to the UK, I'm fairly sure. I think so too. I think so too, but the shipping is really expensive. So that's unfortunately what keeps some um, international people from buying, which is understandable. I hate paying for shipping, it's super frustrating. If you let us move in with you. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> buy us a house, we'll move out there. No, we've actually looked at ways of where we can actually set up, um, not necessarily fulfillment centers, but places where we can like send you boxes in other countries so you don't have to pay the shipping fee. Um, it would just be standard shipping within that country. So we have looked at it and it is something we are keeping in mind. Okay, so Rita's curious, I know we've talked about this too, but what causes the fuzzy edge on some paint? She notices it with green mostly, but did we ever mm -hmm. get to the bottom of why some paint fuzzes on the edges? So a lot of the reason why some of it was kind of fudgy, fudgy, <laughs> fuzzy in subscription boxes is I noticed it was because I was using paint straight from the bottle and not adding any water to it. And that is what created the fuzzy edges. Now, if you were with us in the very beginning, I think that happened in our September box or whatever one we did the citrus with. And um, that is actually something that we've kind of worked on as we mix more paints. So now you shouldn't be seeing like fuzziness within your, the paints that you're using. Um, but a lot of it that I noticed had to do with, I was just grabbing paint straight from the pile and it's, it was pretty concentrated. So it was just kind of bleeding out because of that concentration. So try maybe mixing a little bit of water in there to kind of um, combat that fuzziness. Okay, uh, Maddie Kitty on YouTube. Sarah has done oil painting. She majored in oil painting at the lovely school we went to, Sacramento State Sacramento University. Sacramento State, CSUS. Um, Sky wants to know proper brush care. I left mine in a jar of water all the time because I don't know how to store them properly. Oh, okay. So proper brush care, excellent point. Number one, you do not want to leave your brushes in water for an, exper <laughs> an extended period of time. So even while I'm painting, you've noticed that even though I painted this, I put them on my paper towel because if you leave your brushes in here for a long time, that water softens the bristles and then it can bend the bristles in your cup. So you never want to leave them in your cup wet or damp, bristle down. So what I like to do honestly is when I'm done painting, I'll rinse them in clean water. I'll kind of like hit off the side. I'll lay them down on a piece of paper towel and then after they've dried, I will stand them up in a cup like so. You don't want to use hot water when you're rinsing your brushes because the super hot water will um, disintegrate the glue that keeps the bristles in there. Um, there are like special soaps for cleaning brushes. I personally have never used them with my watercolor brushes. I've only used them with like my oil or acrylic brushes. So unfortunately, um, I think somebody have po people have posted the soaps that they use to keep their um, brushes clean but for me just like rinsing them off and then laying them down that's all I do until they're dry the other thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to like while they're wet don't take a paper towel and like squeeze your bristles I don't know why but my teacher 
yelled at me so hard <laughs> one time when I <laughs> she let us borrow her watercolor brushes and then I, it was a big one too I think it was probably like around 12 and I just like took a paper towel and squeezed it and she was just like probably just pulls on the bristles she's like what are you doing and I was like I don't know I've never used these before so um you can you can shape them so you can kind of like if you have a bigger one and you just want to shape them you can just shape them and then lay them down and let them dry don't crunch them with paper towel or towel or something. All right, speed run. Okay. Doing shirts and aprons. We are doing shirts and aprons. With your sayings on them. Yes, we are. With my face on them. With Michael's face on okay, them. Good. <laughs> uh, second, are dandelion paints sold in sets? They see the PH Martins, but they just want a set. Uh, we are working on getting sets together for a dandelion paint company. I think, I think the biggest thing that's kind of putting us on pause on the shirts and those paint sets is as you guys know we're still dialing in our subscription boxes getting those out on time so as soon as we feel confident and comfortable with the timing of those boxes then we will put together sets we'll be selling merch we'll be doing all of that stuff we have it started but we're really just trying to make sure that you guys get your orders in time and then we'll do all of that fun stuff so just kind of keep an eye out for that here comes a name butchery okay uh raihan Mokthar is from oh. Malaysia, says hello. Oh, hello. Watercolor. Um, and Jill from Western Australia wants to know if you're interested in maybe doing a mythical series, dragons, fairies, wizards, etc. I am fun. I'm so interested in doing a mythical series. I would love doing um, fairies and dragons and what other mythical creatures are there? I can't think. Unicorns. Unicorns. We did a unicorn. Um, that's really fun and I've kept that in mind and I'm sure we'll paint. We're going to paint everything, you guys. We, we do a project a week, you know? We're going to do, we're going to do so many things. Um, the difference between Radiant and Dandelion paints is that Radiant is made by P.H. Martins mm -hmm. and my sweet wife Sarah has been working with a lovely man named Asher mm -hmm. to mix up their own paints to bring in qualities that she likes from PH Martin at an affordable price. Yeah, so we have our own, Dandelion is our own brand. If you go to an art store and you ask for it, they're gonna look at you like you're crazy. I'm sorry if that's happened to you. So you can only get Dandelion paints from us. Um, and we just do that for, you know, control where we, we, we can make as many as we need to make for our customers. Gail, I would assume that Dandelion paints, once they do sets, will probably be a little bit cheaper than buying individually. That's the point Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll discount the set price. Let's see. Debbie's curious about what you learned in Texas. Oh, so Texas, we went to NAMTA, which is the National Art Materials Trade Association, where basically all different art vendors come in this big room and they're trying to convince you of why their product is so amazing, which is so fun because they send you with like so many samples. Um, so we. I really was sent home with probably like a 15 pound bag of samples of different paints, different brands, paper, brushes, all of those things. I'm testing them out um, because I just don't want us to put in our store something I don't stand behind. Um, but some really fun things that happened with that is we made connections with different vendors where you will be seeing gouache very soon in our boxes. Um, we will start carrying different brands of paint because if a lot of you have a problem with the light fat, light light fastness of the paints, which is totally understandable. So we're gonna start carrying those, um, like Daniel Smith, Windsor & Newton, those um, companies that have, that are pigment based, so they will be light fast. So just, again, it's just, we're, we're kind of making sure that our subscription boxes process is set to go, and then we'll start carrying all of those different supplies, and you can add those to your order. Speed round. Okay. Uh, can they send the bottles back to you? No, we don't have a way to get the bottles back to us. Okay. Um, when you do paintings, do you think maybe when you're using dandelion names, maybe shout out the pH name? Because Gail bought a set of pH Martin paints because mm -hmm. you couldn't get a set of dandelion paints. Oh, yeah. So she's lost when you say, you know, whatever you're doing. Yeah, is. usually every project, if it's not in the pre recorded or the live, I try and give you the Dr. PH Martin equivalent to the dandelion. And also, our customer service knows the equivalent. So if you send them an email, hello at letsmakeart.com, they will let you know what the equivalents are. Yes. Okay. Uh, do all the subscription boxes come with the same six colors? Yes. Every subscription box? That you put? Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, month to month. Okay. So everybody who ordered in that one month, it's six colors. The next month, there's a new set of colors. Now sometimes, black 
black usually overlaps and so does yellow and sometimes blue, but usually I would say at least four out of the six are new colors. And then that way you guys are kind of growing your stash. I did see someone comment that they have a lot of black, um, which it kind of makes sense because black is kind of a hard color to mix. So I like to have it in there so it's just easier for you guys, but we don't use it that much. Um, we kind of really just use it for detailing and like eyeballs. So you tend to have a lot left over. Sorry. Here's a little <laughs> Yeah. Uh, dip your fingers in it, swipe it under your eyes and look like a football player. There we free. go. For free. Look at what we're, you uh, can probably like pour it in your hair. Um, just dye your hair. About, you know, if you're going to include gouache and things. And that was something that we did in the early days. Mm -hmm. If you're an OG subscriber and maybe we'll come back. Yeah, we're, we're working with other vendors on how to get gouache inside um, some of your subscription boxes and how we can include gouache in the project because it's super fun. Gouache is really great. Um, it works with watercolor. You can add water to it, but it's not transparent. So you can do backgrounds and you can layer things. And I love it. It's really great. We, we uh, in our very beginning before we made kits, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but when Let's Make Art just started, we didn't make kits and we didn't have a subscription box. We just sold art supplies like another art store and I did a project and then if you wanted to do the exact same one, you had to buy the full bottles of everything. And then we realized that people were spending like 40 bucks a week just to get all the supplies that we were using. So that's why we started making kits just because it's more affordable and you guys don't have to invest so much money to try something. And uh, we use gouache in the beginning days because you would buy a whole tube. And then when we started breaking things up, we weren't sure how we could kind of get smaller tubes in there, but we're working on that now. And I, and I think you guys will see it soon. Okay. Um, Emily on YouTube, lovely name. That's my sister's name. Says yeah. if she doesn't get the box, will normal watercolor paints work instead of gouache? We don't use gouache very often and whatever paint you have will work. Yeah, absolutely. So we haven't used gouache yet. Um, when we start using it, I'll announce it. If you don't have gouache and you don't get the subscription box, you can absolutely still use watercolors. It really just kind of depends on the project that we're doing. Cause I don't want to say that like every single project you can use watercolor and it will be fine. Cause there might be some elements of layering. Um, but just use what you have. Use it and try. Another thing you can try is just acrylic. You can try acrylic instead of watercolor for doing some layering projects. Is Aisha Christine the one that works for you? Mm-hmm. Hi, Aisha. It's Michael. I'm proud of hi, you. Hi, Aisha. You're so great. Doing well. <laughs> Aisha works for our customer service, so if you see her, say hi. She's amazing. She does a great job. Okay. Um, more questions. International shipping. Shipping to Canada cheaper than UK? Probably. It's like right north of us, but I don't know how that works. I don't know if it, I feel like it is cheaper than shipping to UK, but I still know it's pretty pricey. Donna, if it were up to me, I'd give Canada free shipping. If it was up to me, I would give price. all of you free shipping. Okay, let's see what else we got. Uh, favorite painting you've ever made? Favorite what? Painting you've ever painted. Okay. Oh, that's a hard one. But I will say that I recently illustrated a book called Sisterhood. Um, it released a few weeks ago and we'll have it up in our shop soon as soon as we get them in from my publisher. But some of those paintings in there are my favorite paintings I've ever done, ever. And maybe, maybe I'll do a stories of my paintings, my favorite ones I've ever done. But um, I really enjoy portraiture and I really enjoy paintings with um, like hands and botanicals and kind of different things. Are these kit paints? Yeah. People want to know how big they are. How what? Big kit paints. Oh, okay. So if you're, I'll do a, a list of all of my favorite paintings, but some of the, my most favorite paintings I've ever done are in that sisterhood book. I love that book so much. I hope you guys like it too, if you see it. Um, Someone said your galaxy hair girls. Oh, my galaxy hair girls. I love them so much. Yeah, those are some of my favorite. I actually, um, we are working with getting our own bleed proof white mixed so I can include that in the subscription box. And as soon as we can get that bleed proof white nailed down, I'm gonna put that in a box for you guys and we are gonna do galaxies like crazy because I love them so much. And I've been holding off on that. These are our kit paints right here. So this is what, they're five ML bottles right here. They're child proof, which is sometimes Oh, table right here. Ready? Yeah, overhead. There we go. Okay, 
So this, and somebody asked how much paint I put on my palette when I'm painting. Usually like just a little squeeze. So maybe about a dime sized amount is how much paint I use. And because liquid watercolors go a really long way, you can reactivate them. So even when they dry, you can add water, they'll come back up. And you can always add more too if you run out of a color. Um, someone said that import duties on kits can be up to $90. Ooh. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Canada. We're trying. We're really trying. Thanks, Debbie. She said that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody asked about just getting the instruction sheets um, and not the kits. We've really, um, we've taken that seriously and we've talked about it. Um, we'll let you know. Basically, our dilemma is like charging people for it. I don't want to. I would rather just upload it as a PDF and then you guys can print them and use them as you need. Um, but that is not always my only decision to make. So I just have to make sure that everybody is on board with that decision. But yes, very soon we will be making our step outs and our reference things available um, as PDF downloads. So you guys can get that. And that way, if you're international, you can still get those supplies and use whatever painting supplies you have also. Amy Pinker says, add the eye and you're done. <laughs> That's an inside joke for some people. Oh my gosh. If you could, if you <laughs> just knew how much my heart stopped beating when I saw somebody post that picture where I put the wrong instructions, I about died. But you guys are so amazing that you just laughed about it, which I love you. Okay. A um, few things. Sherry says that you can maybe apply for a NAFTA because your kits are made here in the U.S. and we have a trade deal with Canada. To learn oh, to okay. Okay. Second of all, this sounds like French to me because I'm not a gouache artist. Uh huh. Christy says, do you know how to dry gouache in pants without it cracking? And does this work as well if you use it fresh out of the tube? Okay. So there's a couple different types of gouache. Um, the gouache that I've used before is a acrylic gouache. That's what we sell in our store. Now with that one, um, that one cannot be reactivated. So once it dries in your pan or on your palette, it's done kind of like acrylic paint. It's like over with. But standard gouache, you can reactivate. So even if it's dried in your pan, you can add water to it, you can bring it back. Same with your painting. Even if your painting is dry, it's like watercolor. You can bring it back with some water. Um, so it depends on the type of gouache you get if it can be re reactivated or not. Most of the time when I use my acrylic gouache, I just have this palette and I just layer it on top of each other, similar to acrylic. Patty Powers, right off the bat, you've got the best name ever. Patty Powers, that is a great name. <laughs> Second of all, she says she discovered today that her pH Martin paints need to be shaken. There's a residue on the bottom. Is that what you've experienced? Yes, so with Dr. PH Martin's, the radiant colors, and I think even the hydrous colors, that color gets together on the bottom and it just lays there. Totally normal, you just shake, shake that little sucker up. You just like, so, <laughs> sometimes what I'll do is I actually will just hit it against my leg and break it up and mix it in. I don't think our Dr. PH Martin paints do that. Sometimes they can get a little bit um, thick which we're working on. Um, but the Dr. PH Martins, there is a residue. Shake it up, totally normal. That's how they are. Okay. I know I just said Patty Powers has the best name. And it's a great one. But do we I, have another one? I think we just one up ourselves with William Wiggly. <laughs> William Wiggly. He's curious that is a great a name. that in the future you will cut a deal with PBS to be the next boss. <laughs> William Wiggly, you're a hero among men. William Wiggly, that's so great. I don't think there can ever be another Bob Ross or if they would even be interested because he's just the end all. Um, but that would be cool. They haven't contacted me yet, but I'll let you know if they do. <laughs> um, I don't know how long you want this to go. What time is it? Got, it's, we've been on for an hour and a half. Wow, what? Hour and five. Oh, okay. It's 8.05. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Um, what's the best way to flatten a warped painting? Even if you take it down, still a little wavy sometimes. Mm -hmm. Iron it. Can you Sometimes you can iron paintings. What I'll do is I'll flip it over and iron the back part. Another thing that I will do is I will get a very, very heavy, thick textbook and I'll stick my painting in there and I'll shut it 
and then hopefully that will straighten it out. I have noticed too that if I just put it in a frame, it will flatten out. So um, again, because I don't work a lot with originals, um, it hasn't really been a problem for me because I'll just scan it and then it just lives in a drawer in my desk for the rest of its life. Um, but you can try ironing it, you can try squishing it with a book, or you can just frame it in a glass and that glass will keep it flat. Hashtag free the painting. Hashtag free the paintings. Um, I really should just like, I don't know, give them away. There's hundreds. It's ridiculous. Sherry Wells Keys, I'm happy I caught you. She says, how much water do you add to the dime size amount of PH Martin's watercolor? You don't. Okay, so that's a great question. So she asked how much water you add. So with the radiant colors or these liquid watercolors, you can use the colors straight, like with a damp brush. Of course, you're going to want to use a damp brush. You can use it straight out or you add water to it to lighten it. So again, with watercolor, this is the amazing thing about them. You don't use white paint to make the color lighter, you just use more water. So um, usually if I want something to be strong in color, I will have, or a darker value, I will just do straight paint. And then if I want to lighten it up, I'll just add water to it. So just depending on how light you want the color to be is how much water you add to it. And with my palette that I use here, I'm a huge fan of mixing. So I put my paint along the edge of my palette and then I'll pick up paint and move it to the middle and then like mix from there or add water from there. Like I'm not gonna go in straight with my pure paint and then like put a bunch of water on there. I don't do that. I take some out, add water to it and then that's what I pull from. <laughs> Maybe we should go till 8.15. Okay, well we got about 10 minutes, so if you got any okay. questions, put them forward. I got tons more. Um, Cynthia wants to know if she can use a white ceramic plate as a palette. Yes, you That's can add. uses all the time. You can nice use, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all of my butcher tray palettes are here at the studio and at the office. So at home, I just use our dinner plates, which are white. So you can absolutely use glass plates. You can use, um, don't use paper plates because the watercolor will absorb into the paper. And if you use plastic, it will beat up on the plastic, which is fine. That's not a huge deal, but I usually try and stay with ceramic or glass. And you want to do it white underneath. Your palette usually wants to be white because if you have a different color underneath there, then it will actually distort the color on the palette. And so when you go to grab a color and you put it down in your paper, you're like, oh, that's different than what I thought. We have an uproar of people wanting more mini challenges. Okay, mini challenges, yes. You guys did awesome with our Valentine's Day one. Our winners, I'm shipping your winnings out this week, so keep an eye on that. And we will do more. I would like to do a challenge a month. Um, I, but I, you know, we got a lot going on too, so. Are we okay? Hold, well, please. What's wrong? Did my mic die? All of our mics are dead. <laughs> oh no. Are the batteries dead? Do we have more batteries? Yeah, they're plugged in right there in that plug. There's only two. Well, mine take two. Are mine dead? Yeah. Is it this one or is it that one? Here, paint something pretty. Put it on the top. Melanie says she can hear us. Well, she shouldn't. Gerilyn says she can hear us too. You guys, you're doing so great. You're so amazing. Me. They're on top, Cam. Judy can hear. Yeah, I think everyone can hear us still, my dear. Well, both mics are off right now, so I don't know how. <laughs> Is that better? They can hear you through yours, but it's blinking to death. Say hold, please. Hold. Just give us a second, you guys. Should be good. Okay, we're back. We had to change batteries. 
I think you were hearing us off the camera and not off the mic. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Yours died. I turned it back on and it had just enough juice for them oh, to hear. Oh, okay. We replaced the batteries though, so we're good. Camper is a good idea. Okay, I mean, we had, sorry, I gotta scroll back up on all these. We can hear you. Um, yeah. Okay, we're back online. Oh, let me look at my list. I like made a list of questions and let me make sure. Oh, some of you have asked what my process is for creating those subscription box and how I choose. So um, there's a couple of things I keep in mind. One of them is I need to stick to a color palette, right? So we have six colors that I'll choose from. So usually I pick the six colors that I want it to be and I try and switch up the color palette from the month before. So I kind of just think, what colors did I use last month? Switch it up. And then I just try and keep different, it's more just like keeping different things in mind, which is I try and keep in mind what month it is. So then the season and maybe a holiday if it's in there. I also always try and do an animal, um, a landscape, and then like a kind of more loose free paint, uh, like free loose painting. Our tree one is our March one. Um, and then I just try and make sure that all of those four paintings together um, feel like they go together, not necessarily in themes, but just in color and palettes. So that's my process. Usually I'll just like get an idea and I'll just like think about it for like a couple of weeks and then usually when I sit down to paint I have an idea of what all those projects are going to be. So hopefully that helps. Lovely. I have other stuff. Does somebody have a question or there's a couple other questions? You do you. Um, another question was finding your own style. How do you find your own style? Finding your own style takes time. Um, if anything I would say like you're just gonna be painting so much. When you start painting, you really need a lot of help. That's where we come in. Or maybe you like to paint, but you just don't know what to think about. That's also where we come in. Um, but you'll notice as you paint more that you are gonna want to do certain things. Just the way you paint or just the colors you choose, you're just gonna gravitate towards certain things. Um, also, it's the styles that you like, that kind of thing. Um, after you've been doing that for a really long time, you're gonna get to a point, I feel like, you kind of make your own style when you can paint something without having to look at another artist's painting. So um, that's kind of the way that I, cause I, I learned watercolor from um, looking at an illustrator that I loved and doing her paintings and that's how I taught myself watercolor. And then I noticed that all of the things that I was making was looking just like hers and I actually had to reference hers in order to complete my own ideas which is not what you wanna do. If you just wanna be able to like not look at any other artist's work and you can just do it, and that is when you start making your own style. And it's just a process and it's frustrating and it takes time and just know that your style changes all the time. My style has totally changed now than from what it was three years ago when I first started. And that's okay, it's, it's a constant thing that you just work on. Someone says you should do a painting night where you just use coffee and wine as the colors. Yes. You can just do browns and reds. Everything would be fun. Yeah, no, it would be fun. I used, I think for Father's Day for Michael's dad and my dad, I painted their favorite um, cars in coffee. And they were beautiful. They turned out so great. I love painting with coffee because that brown you get is so warm. It's a great brown. Um, Deb is curious. She wants to give the boxes a gift, but not a subscription. I would say just subscribe, have the box ship, and don't renew. So what you can do if you wanna give the box as a gift is we do have a three month gift option, which it's not reoccurring. So you pay for the three months up front, but then it stops and you don't have to worry about canceling it and you get all of those things. Now, if you wanna gift somebody one box, then you would have to sign up for the subscription and just remember to cancel before the next box ships. Um, but our three month subscription box like gift thing that we have on our website, really popular and just perfect. And, um, they get it for three months and they get to try, what is that, 12 different paintings. It's pretty great. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up. I got a couple little speed rounds. Okay. Uh, Donna says, should paintings consist of only warm or cold colors or should you mix them? Whatever you feel like. Yeah, warm and cold colors, really whatever you feel like. I tend to mix them. Um, it really just depends on the painting. 
I, you know what? Was it Donna that asked that? Donna, yes. Donna, you trust you and you try it. And there might be a painting that's a little bit of hot, of warm and cool and you don't like that. But I've noticed that for me, if I tend to stay like all cool, it bothers me, I don't know why. Unless I'm painting like a galaxy, then that makes sense. Whatever you want, really. Nancy wants more biology topics so that I can contribute. I would love that. <laughs> I would love that too. Our last and final question to wrap it up. Wait, are you on the front cam still or overhead? Front. Okay, great. The last perfect question to wrap this all up. Gail yeah. says, it's her first time here. She's new. Do you do this every Tuesday night? And what time? Okay, Gail, great question and welcome. Thanks for being here. Every Tuesday night, we're here painting 7.15 Central Standard Time. We usually are painting a project. They take about an hour and a half to two hours, and we just paint the project together. You're at home painting, I'm here painting. You guys can ask questions along the way. Now, these uh, videos are available after we record them. So don't stress if you can't be in here for the paint along, we put them on YouTube and on our Facebook and our website. So you have access to them at any time. And also don't be stressed out if you cannot keep up with the paintings. A lot of people uh, will watch the tutorial first so they have an idea of where we're going and then they'll take their paint stuff out and paint with me. So just whatever works for you. All right, I think that's it for the um, live tonight. You guys are so great. I'm so happy that you were here to talk to me. I really didn't think a lot of people would come, but you guys are wonderful. Thank you so much for your support. We're growing and we are sometimes late in our boxes, but you guys have been so positive and forgiving and I really appreciate that. Um, two little things that I just wanna announce is we have a Facebook group um, called Let's Make Art Watercolor. And we now have a lettering group called Let's Make Art Lettering. Both are great. Um, if you are part of our watercolor group, it's big now. We're at like 11,000 people. It is huge. Uh, one thing I just want to ask you guys to keep in mind is just be respectful towards each other. Uh, we have lots of people with different personalities. And um, I just want you to accept people for who they are and, you know, kind of just be kind. That's that's the thing. So I know that some of you get really defensive of Let's Make Art, and I really appreciate that. You guys are wonderful supporters, but let's still try and be respectful and kind within that domain. We are working on getting uh, monitors because and moderators because there's just so much. I, we can't keep up with it all. Um, but for the most part, it's really positive. It's really supportive, and I appreciate you guys making that the way it is. Um, the second announcement is we are going to have our live paint along for our treetop this Friday at 7.15. That's, that's new. Well, we did it last month because we were late, but it's, it's rare, hopefully. And that's just, we want to give as much time as we can to get those boxes to you before we do that live. And um, I think that's it. Oh, have you guys seen our new boxes? So if you've seen our April ads, you've seen them. So this is what's going to come to you in April is we designed these new boxes. So when you see this on your door, you'll have your uh, subscription in this in April. Super exciting, fun stuff. So uh, that's it. I think that's all I need to say, right? Yeah. Michael, I love you and thank you for being here. I love you and thank you for following your passion <laughs> and judging all of these people's lives. And you guys, I love you guys. Thanks for being here and painting and trying something new and giving me a chance to share this with you. I, I just, I can't get over how amazing this community is. You are what makes it how it is. And um, I'm thankful every day that I get to do this because this is my dream job. So that's it. Love you guys. See you Friday. Bye.